So on to all the other announcements in hardware news this week, like AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA all talking about their upcoming products. There are several motherboards that got announced, and although we don't have them in hand yet, they'll be coming out soon. The most interesting of those, we think, are the WRX80 boards. These are for Threadripper Pro, although most people probably aren't getting Threadripper Pro CPUs. Uh, it's still really interesting because the boards have a lot of features that you don't find on traditional consumer class motherboards. Before that, this video is brought to you by Crucial Ballistics Memory, including the new kits targeted for use with AMD's new Ryzen 5000 CPUs. Crucial's new Ballistics Max Memory is some of the highest performing memory on the market and can be tuned for timings and clocks to improve performance. The company also has its other Crucial Ballistics kits for a more affordable entry to enthusiast-grade memory. Crucial is a Micron brand and has direct access to its own memory supply. Learn more at the link in the description below. Boards that got announced in the past couple of days, they're the Threadripper Pro ones, and then of course Z590, which will accompany Rocket Lake S. Rocket Lake S is the desktop Intel part coming up. It's 11900K, 11700K, and so forth. That won't arrive the CPUs, that is, until about March. And the motherboards, you can technically buy them early if the manufacturer decides to make it available early. But why you would do that is mostly lost on us, uh, unless you're just going to buy it and then sit around and wait for the CPUs to come out and hope you get one. Because socketing 10 series into Z590, although possible, doesn't make a lot of sense. But anyway, that's the plan on Z590. There were a ton of them announced, as always, with desktop platforms. Some of them are really interesting, and we'll talk about those. But uh, the WRX80 stuff has some features that are, again, not commonly discussed in this sector of coverage. Uh, things like IPMI. We talked about that last time when we worked with Wendell, actually, on building our server. Wendell from Level 1 Techs set up an IP IPMI system for us via an ASRock server motherboard so that we could access uh, everything on the system remotely. And that will show you things like the power quality or uh, the fan RPMs, the temperature, Anything that you can normally read through something like Hardware Info 64, for example, can be read via the motherboard over the network. And then uh, also BMC presence. There's onboard video for the Threadripper boards, despite being no IGP in the CPU itself. And we'll be talking about all that. So for Threadripper Pro, the CPUs and associated pre-builds became available last year in OEM format. It was mostly Lenovo selling them. You couldn't buy them separately. They are now leaving Lenovo or OEM exclusivity and coming to market for DIY. The expectation is sometime first quarter 2021, likely March. Threadripper Pro in its current format is still the Threadripper 3970X in a sense and 3990X in a sense uh, with some others. The 5000 series Threadripper parts are not yet announced. We would expect them at some point but we don't have any information from AMD or its partners on when that might happen. In the current iteration, the Threadripper Pro series runs the same physical CPU as the 32-core, 64-core options, except with a few changes internally, and uh, the socket is the same, but the platform is different. Memory channels, for example, are expanded to 8 from 4 on the non-pro CPUs. The non-pro Threadripper CPUs support up to 88 PCIe lanes off of the CPU, with Pro moving instead to a maximum of 128 lanes. In effect, it's a mini Epic CPU. The CPU models change names as well. So the 3995WX is the workstation-oriented 3990X, basically at 64 cores, 128 threads, and similar specs. Otherwise, this naming carries on with the 3970X turning into a 3975WX. The 3960X gets skipped. The 3955WX is a 16-core, 32-thread CPU, and the 3945WX is a 12-core, 24-thread part. These will now be available via DIY markets, previously restricted to OEM-only channels. So then, if only because they're cool, and not necessarily because we expect uh, viewers to go the WRX Pro route, we'll talk through some of the motherboards. The Asus one definitely gets first mention. It's the most gamered-out Pro board that we've seen yet. So it's got some unnecessary features, but it's also uh, probably going to be the, the most expensive one of the three we've thus far seen. Prices, by the way, uh, not available for this one. So the Asus board, it's the WSWRX80 Sage SE. It's new to the DIY market. It appeared on Asus's product page officially this past week. And the WRX80 Sage is clearly a massive board. Asus, unfortunately, doesn't yet have the specs page live. You click on it, it goes to nothing. So we don't know the actual dimensions of it. Uh, it is in the extended ATX family. We don't know if it's SSI, EEB, CEB, or, or somewhere in between. So 
Uh, it's got eight memory slots with two-sided VRM, so the VRM is on both sides of the socket, or at least bits and pieces of it are. Uh, 10 gigabits also going to be on the, the side closest to the I.O. And then the motherboard is rotated in the socket area so that the memory is at the top and at the bottom of the CPU socket instead of the left and the right. The memory slots are rotated to vertically flank the socket, which is fine in controlled OEM environments, but does mean you'll need to pay attention to radiator and fan clearance with custom builds. The left VRM heatsink has the outline of a 40 millimeter fan if you look really closely under that mesh cover on top. And that mesh cover over the heatsink itself is interesting because it could be easily removed for dust cleaning. Maybe that's why they put it there as a filter over the fan or just to look cool. We're not sure. It could be either. The right side doesn't have anywhere visible to support a fan, but the heatsink connects at least indirectly at the base to the chipset heatsink, which does include a fan. Flanking that, full length M.2 slots run below and right of the chipset Pro Series cover. Another M.2 heatsink can be seen right of the right side VRM below the seven segment debug display. Also in this area, Asus has moved all of its power connectors to the right side of the board rather than the typical locations for consumer boards. This includes two EPS 12 volt connectors and interestingly, one PCIe 8 pin connector. We think this goes to motherboard power and doesn't act as PCIe aux power because if you look below the PCIe slots at the bottom of the board, there are two separate PCIe auxiliary connectors. Asus likely chose to use 2 by EPS and 1 by PCIe to ensure better power supply compatibility because very few power supplies have three EPS 12 volt cables and the high-end power supply market has been taxed for inventory this past year already. A few other interesting things, so there's a five pin PSU SMB connector to the left of the PCIe cable and then above that there's a dip switch labeled zero underscore PSU underscore switch. We're not 100% sure on the dip switch, we think it's probably to toggle the uh, PSU SMB data that could be used to communicate power supply information to the motherboard and then out through IPMI uh, and, and this dip switch might let you turn that off, but we're not 100% sure on that. Other I.O. includes two U.2 connectors, eight SATA connectors, and the aforementioned M.2 devices. Scattered around the board, there's also a BMC switch in the bottom right for toggling the baseboard management controller to allow IPMI and remote management of the system. Again, this is something we showed a version of when we did a server build with Wendell from Level 1 Techs previously. There's also an IPMI switch left of this, then a VGA switch left of that, another security feature. This board has onboard video, but remember that Threadripper doesn't have an IGP, so it's all powered via a separate chip on the board that can process basic video, and that's about it. The VGA switch sits above VGA underscore header, uh, and then there's a, that's a 16 pin connector on some ASUS boards. The board also has a BMC debug header, and left of all this, an SD card reader on the motherboard itself. This is labeled MSD1, and upon looking around, it seems some ASUS rack mount server solutions have this. We're not 100% sure the specific use for MSD1, or if it's as innocuous as simply reading an SD card, but we did some initial research, and it seems like these are typically used for lightweight hypervisor support. However, if you have additional information on that, feel free to comment below. Up near the socket in the VRM, there's also an SPI TPM header, ASUS offers a separate daughter board with a trusted platform module on it, and this is used for storing credentials securely. Things like biometrics or smart card data could be stored here as an example. So again, the board's interesting because it has a lot of stuff we don't typically encounter in our segment of the market. That's why we wanted to really walk through that one. Uh, the features mostly make it easier to lock down individual bits and pieces, so you could use it as a standalone workstation or as a server in a server closet somewhere and get all the remote access features. Uh, if you wanted to set this up as a home server, it'd be a very powerful one. You could still remotely access it and use it as a workstation if you needed to check in on it while you leave the house or the office. Other information on the page lacks price or a firm release date, probably March, not sure though. It does state the presence of a 16-phase VRM. It does support RDIMMs, and there's presence of additional security features, most of which we went through. Up next is Supermicro. So Supermicro also announced the motherboard. Supermicro has tried to break into the gaming and consumer space a few times now. They've had mixed success, mostly not success in the high-end gaming space. But uh, Supermicro is well known for professional class motherboards and server motherboards. So if you haven't heard the name before, it's, this isn't like a fly-by-night. They've been around a long time and have, a, uh, have credibility in the server space. So the company this week announced a new M12 SWA TF workstation motherboard. 
And this is for the Threadripper Pro CPUs as well, the 3000 series TR Pro chips. The board has a more detailed specs list on the website than Asus did, but only one low resolution image, unfortunately. It's running two by eight EPS 12 volt connectors, a standard 24 pin and an optional eight pin auxiliary power connector for the PCIe slots. This is a six slot board with 16 wire by 16 wiring to all slots. The memory slots are still vertically arranged with the VRM left and right of the socket. And then there's also four exposed M.2 slots right of the chipset, which is cooled with a simple heatsink and fan. The entire board is highly accessible because it lacks all of the adornishments that uh, Asus decides to put on its boards. There's pros and cons to both. In the instance of this one, it's a very simple board and it doesn't have all the extras so you can get to everything pretty easily. In terms of the spec sheet, like the Asus board, it, this has VGA, and onboard video capabilities. Supermicro offers this via the A-Speed AST 2600 BMC graphics chip. The spec sheet lists two U.2 ports, four SATA 3 ports, one COM port, a TPM2 header, one gigabit ethernet uh, switch, as in single gigabit ethernet switch with IPMI support, and then a 10 gigabit base TLAN option and a 112 volt power header for liquid cooling. Finally, in the AMD WRX80 motherboard lineup, Gigabyte also announced a new board. This one was more similar to the Supermicro one than it was to the Asus board. So the WRX80 SU IPMI board is the new one from Gigabyte. Uh, this is an SSI CEB form factor. It does have dimensions listed on the website for this one, uh, 30 and a half by 26.7 centimeters. Like Supermicro, Gigabyte doesn't go too crazy with the metal embellishments and heat sinks. It's a simple server board in that sense. It has a small heat sink for the MOSFETs and the chipset, and that's about it. This one runs seven PCIe slots, all of which appear to be electrically wired for by 16 uh, It's got all single slot spacing for those. The board has USB type A connectors on board. It's got two USB 3.0 headers, a USB 2.0 header, a few hardware buttons for reset and power, two M.2 slots flanking the chipset, and a replaceable BIOS chip. Uh, left of the socket when in standard orientation. This board also has IPMI support as the others and onboard video, this time via A-Speed's AST2500 BMC, uh, allowing support for, again, a monitor and simple video out. So now that we've gotten through the new Threadripper stuff, on to Intel. Intel's 500 series motherboards were announced at CES last week. That included the Z590 boards, of course, but also B560, H570, and H510. Now this time, B560 is a lot more interesting than the B-series boards were last time, and that's because memory overclocking is finally going to be unlocked on the lower tier Intel chipsets. So you don't need Z590 now to do memory overclocking. Unfortunately, you'll still need K-SKU CPUs to do things like multiplier overclocking, or probably memory overclocking, but we'll see. Uh, but the, the motherboard itself will no longer be as much of an inhibitor. So the main change for the 500 series is a doubling of DMI for some chipsets, uh, Z590 for example, but otherwise 20 gigabit per second support added for Rocket Lake S assortments now. A PCIe Gen 4 support is off the CPU, so you get 16 PEG lanes for PCIe graphics via Rocket Lake S CPUs. So that first slot in a motherboard uh, typically anyway, will have 16 lanes going to it from the CPU. This is standard, except those are going to be PCIe Gen 4 now. The chipset itself is still Gen 3, so that hasn't changed. The HSIO lanes off of the chipset are still Gen 3. Uh, it's just that it's, it's Gen 4 on the CPU split, and there's a by 4 Gen 4 option for an M.2 SSD off of the CPU as well. Uh, still supports 128 gigabytes of memory for the new CPUs. It's DDR4-3200 natively supported now, up from, I think it was 2933 before. And, you know, we were running 3200. Most people in our audience would be running some form of XMP anyway, but bumping that up is always uh, a good thing, even if we're already running it in our test platforms. In terms of compatibility, just to make sure everyone's on the same page here. So, 11 series CPUs can socket into Z490 boards. If you bought, say, Z490 and a 10600K, then you can socket the 11 series into it. If you're planning to run a 500 series board, you could technically put a 10 series CPU in it. It just doesn't make a ton of sense. There's probably a few scenarios where it makes sense, but uh, not too common. So that's the compatibility. Uh, Z590 boards that are worthy of note, there were about 50 designs announced last week, if not more, but we saw about 50 of them. There were only a few we wanted to bring up because this is the kind of thing that'll be more interesting as the reviews start rolling out. But 
the three the ones we wanted to bring up include an OC board that's more it's like in the more standard high price territory and then some absolutely ridiculously priced boards that probably no one will buy but they're at least interesting most of these boards have a spec sheet that reads something similar to this they're typically 10 plus usb options six or more sata ports two high bandwidth NICs. Uh, that's 10 and 2.5 gigabits per second a wi-fi 6 uh, and bluetooth 5.1 module 7.1 hd audio three or four m.2 slots and ARGB connectivity in most instances. So the first one, the Z590 Dark. If you remember the Kingpin edition uh, from the Z490 series, this one's similar. If you want a Kingpin signature, there might be another Kingpin edition released for the Z590 generation. Uh, but like for the Z490 version, this board is specifically geared towards overclocking, so it has different CPU and memory slot configurations than some of the other boards. There are only two memory slots, and the CPU and socket or memory slot configuration is rotated 90 degrees in an effort to make the traces shorter. Another commonality with the Z490 version and a future geared towards overclocking is that the PCB is a 10 layer design. The major difference is that the VRM gets an upgrade going from 18 phases on the Z490 variant to 22 phases in the current iteration. There are many other expected OC features as well, like auxiliary power connections, uh, configurable seven segment displays, and probe points for meters. So uh, we still wanna see EVGA make one of these boards for AM4, but for now it looks like they're doing it for the 11 series at least. Up next is the Asus ROG Maximus 13 <laughs> Extreme Glacial. The numerals are getting high enough, it's getting difficult to read at a glance. This one ticks all the boxes on the spec list mentioned a moment ago with an additional note for having five M.2 slots. The board gets its name from a custom EK water block, a complete, basically a monoblock solution that EK christened the Ultra Block. We don't know much about it yet, except that it's made of copper and seemingly covers the CPU, the VRM, and it looks like the chipset, maybe an M.2 slot as well. This might show up in a teardown video in the future, but otherwise we don't really think we're probably, probably not gonna be using it. Couple things with this one. First of all, that chipset lighting, although it looks very nice for those who like that sort of thing, uh, it will be covered by a GPU. So, and then secondly, Tom's Hardware claims that this board will cost $1,800. So if that's the case, don't buy it because that's insane. Now you're paying very close to four times the price of the CPU, assuming it's still a $500 flagship, for the motherboard. That's insane. But anyway, $1,800, $1,843, according to Tom's Hardware. Uh, really no reason you should be buying that, but <laughs> that's what happens when you pair Asus and EK to work on one product. MSI has two boards worth maybe mentioning as well. The Z590 Godlike and the MPG Z590 Carbon EKX. These are noteworthy because uh, the first one, the Godlike is another over $1,000 price tag. That makes three boards in the Z590 release that cost more than an enthusiast PC build in its entirety. And this also brings up the question of whether Gigabyte will join the over $1,000 water cooling party. It has a lot to offer. It's difficult, again, to justify, especially when the MSI Ace offers many of the same features at less than half the price. As for Gigabyte, the flagship offering from Gigabyte touts a 21 phase VRM delivering 100 amps per phase. This is the highest per phase current number that we've seen in the CES announcements. Otherwise, this board falls in line with the competition. So that'll be it for now. Over the years, we've noticed there's always a lot less interest in the Z-Series motherboard uh, coverage pieces than in the other motherboards that come out on market, probably because a lot of the brands have really established themselves and their models to where it's not too much of a surprise anymore. Now, uh, although there's maybe an instance where it makes sense to make two grand for motherboard, like say a W3175X or maybe an Epic CPU, paying $1,800 if that's what the real cost will be for a motherboard water block or not, uh, is insane when you're talking about $500 CPU. It's the VRM is is not necessary at that level, and especially when it's obviously geared towards water cooling, not LN2 anyway. But anyway, that's another story for a different time. Uh, that's going to be the motherboard recap for CES last week. The Threadripper stuff and Intel stuff is mostly what we're going to be seeing over the next three months. 
March looks like it's about the CPU rollout for the 11 series, but we'll see if that moves around a little bit as time advances. And otherwise, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to support us directly. And we'll see you all next time.